Good morning. Let's get started. Any questions? No. Questions? Yes, please. Okay, so there is a question here about the reference point in finite or infinite charge distributions. Uh, first of all, the reference point for the potential, just like you know for altitude that we set zero altitude at uh, sea level and sea level changes from place to place in the earth and then uh, we calculate altitude with respect to the sea level and so on. So this is sort of an arbitrary choice. Now this arbitrary choice can be made at infinity if you have a finite charge distribution uh, and uh, I will give some examples uh, today as well. So finite charge distributions are finite disks, finite plates, everything finite. If you try to choose your reference point at infinity for the infinite line charge, the example that we did last time, you will see it doesn't work because then the infinity goes into the logarithm and just diverges. And no matter how many examples you try, you will find the same thing. So why does this happen? It happens because if you have charges at infinity, it simply does not make physical sense to set potential equal to zero where there is plenty of charges. So this is not just a mathematical intricacy, it is actually a physical, it has a physical meaning that if I set somewhere zero potential, physically it has to be far from my sources. I cannot go in the middle of my sources to set the potential to zero and the math will tell me that. Now, uh, where do you set the reference point? I think you can refer to the example I, I showed for the line charge. You can set it to any arbitrary distance that you set other than infinity. And uh, for example, if you have a power line, that's the example that I discussed last time, that runs over ground, okay? A very reasonable place to set uh, zero potential is the ground. So this is a finite distance from the power line. So anywhere finite would work. You can see that in the equations. You put, you set r equal to our reference and you set the potential there to zero. So that would work. But if you have finite charge distributions, then you can set the reference for potential to infinity. First of all, remember that we calculated the potential of a single point charge at the origin and we found it with reference to infinity that it was q by 4 pi epsilon naught r squared. Okay. So if I have uh, a distance r from the uh, charge, this is the potential that I will measure. So not r, sorry, not r squared, r. q by 4 pi epsilon not r. So how do I read this formula physically? The potential is equal to charge divided by 4 pi epsilon not uh, times distance from the potential. So now if I move this charge to an arbitrary point, So if the charge is not at the origin anymore, but it is at a point that is defined by distance vector r primed, then what is my potential at a observation point P? Anybody can guess? So this uh, reminds you sort of the, of the superposition we run to calculate fields from charges. So now I move, the, uh, I move the charge away from the origin. What is now my potential at this point P, distance vector R? Any ideas? So now you have this distance. So the potential now will be q by 4 pi epsilon naught r minus r prime. 
this new distance. So the physics does not change. The potential with reference to infinity of a point charge will always be q by 4 pi epsilon naught times the distance you have from the charge. So the physics does not, share, uh, does not care about what coordinate system you choose. That is up to you. But the physical reality is always the same, that the potential will be q by 4 pi epsilon naught uh, times distance. So now this is the distance. So then uh, we can think about the problem of uh, the uh, electric potential of uh, finite, and I emphasize finite, charge distributions. And I'd like to uh, make it a bit more specific and present the concept through an example. And the example is a charged disk. Uh, so uh, can you see this part of the board? Can everybody see this part of the board? OK, let me. So this is uh, my geometry. I have a disk here. It's sort of a one plate of a capacitor, if you, if you wish. And uh, it supports a surface charge density, constant surface charge density, rho s comma zero. Uh, the distance is, uh, sorry, the radius of the disk is A. So now I have a surface charge density. that is finite and it is constant for distance between 0 and A, which is the disk, and uh, the disk sits on the z equal 0 plane. And obviously, if we want to uh, also, uh, set the third uh, cylindrical coordinate. Uh, it should scan all its possible values. So phi should vary from 0 to 2 pi. So we have all the points on the disk supporting a constant surface charge density. So I'm asking what is now the potential at a point on the axis, 0, 0, z. So you see, this is problem is reminiscent of the problems that we solved by superposition to find fields of charge distributions. And if you remember, the steps that we followed for these was, first of all, to break the charge distribution into a set of point charges. We are in a similar situation as in Coulomb's law. We know what's the potential of a point charge, but now we have a charge distribution on a disk. So the first step should be to break this charge distribution into uh, elementary small, differentially small point charges on this plane. So this is uh, actually the very first step was to choose the coordinate system. And here you see the cylindrical symmetry. The disk is cylindrical symmetric. If you move around uh, the z-axis, you see exactly the same thing. And therefore, this is uh, the kind of structure that would lend itself to cylindrical coordinates. You can also see the way that I described it. So you see, if, uh, if I were to describe a disk with Cartesian coordinates, I would have to write x squared plus y squared uh, uh, less than, than alpha. Well, r is uh, square of x squared plus y squared. So here, the description in cylindrical coordinates is much easier. No square roots, no squares. And therefore, I choose the cylindrical coordinate system. 
So the second part is to analyze the distribution down to point charges. So I will draw two diagrams. And by the way, your book has a similar example for Coulomb's law. So uh, the steps up to a point will be exactly the same. So if we want to identify, to break this down to point charges, I will go on the disk and I will uh, define a differentially small surface area that is defined like this. You go and you change. So you start from this point here on the disk. You change your radial coordinate by dr. And you change your phi coordinate by d phi. And you define this small patch. So I will enlar enlarge this so that you see it on the xy plane, on the plane of the disk. So this is the disk. And this is the area that I define on the disk. So this is uh, r. That's where I started. This is dr. Here I change my phi coordinate by d phi. And hence the arc length that I have traced is r times d phi. So the ds that I have defined in that manner is dr times r d phi. And if this seems too difficult to you, just go to your age sheet, cylindrical coordinates, differential surface elements. You will see that two of the three contain a dz. If they contain a dz, these are not the ones that you should use because the disk is on the z equal zero plane. So if you have a dz, that means you are departing from the plane and you are going somewhere else where you are not supposed to be. So therefore, the only choice that you have is really the ds, which is r d phi dr. So then, my point charge that finds itself right here, dq, I assign to it coordinates, and remember, just like we did in Coulomb's law, because this is a source, I will assign to it prime coordinates, because I reserve the unprimed coordinates for my observation point. So I will say that dq is at some r primed, phi primed, zero, and it has a position vector, position vector, Again, if you go to the um, aid sheet, position vectors in cylindrical coordinate systems, the general form is this, r prime r hat plus z prime z hat, but z prime here is zero. So it is r primed r hat primed. And I'd like to emphasize in this example that I prime also the unit vector r hat. And the reason is that the unit vectors, except for the Cartesian coordinate unit vectors, change with position. So this one will also be integrated when I apply superposition on the sources to find the total potential that is created at the observation point. This r hat unit vector is pointing at the charge, 
whenever you have unit vectors like this, or any unit vectors that are not in Cartesian coordinates, immediately you replace them with Cartesian unit vectors. So I will take this extra step of replacing this with x cosine phi prime plus y sine phi prime. And again, you can find this uh, in the um, in your uh, aid sheet. So uh, important point here, we had a position vector for the charge dq. We have to make sure that now it is primed. If I had x hat, z, y hat, z hat, I don't care to prime them because x hat, y hat, z hat are always fixed in space. And there is always in everybody's mind in everybody's mind, there is a confusion about the nature of unit vectors. Unit vectors are not necessarily supposed to be fixed in space. This is a unique property of the x, y, z um, unit vectors. This one just changes. It changes, and you can see that in its expression. It's x cosine phi plus y sine phi. So if you have a point here, the R unit vector is along the x core, the x axis. If, if your point is here, the R unit vector is along the y axis. So it can uh, rotate on this disk. So therefore, we have to replace uh, the unit vector with its uh, expression in Cartesian unit vectors just to keep track of this rotation. So that is an extra step. All right, um, so then I go to the third step, uh, which is the calculation of the potential that this charge produces at the observation point. So the observation point has this position vector. The distance from the charge can be found by computing the distance in this, uh, of this vector here, z, z hat minus r prime r hat <coughs> prime. Uh, this distance, you can find it in many ways. The easiest way is to see geometrically here that this is my observation point. So this is z. This is my dq at r primed. So here you have a right angle triangle and the distance is, so this is uh, the r minus r prime. So the distance is simply r prime squared plus z squared. So now I can apply the formula for the potential that this point charge generates at the observation point. I'm, uh, I have everything that I need. Uh, I have the dq. The dq is uh, charge this density times this uh, ds that I have found. And uh, I have the distance. So dq is the charge density times my elementary surface area. OK, so this is the um, potential that is created at the observation point. 
Any questions up to this point? So you see, we have here a repetition of the process that we applied for superposition of fields. Now it's a little bit easier because we don't have vectors. We work with a potential that is a scalar. So we have uh, one step less, we don't have uh, there a vector quantity multiplying this uh, dv. This dv is scalar. Okay, so fourth step is now I integrate throughout the distribution. These elements here show me where I should take the integration. It should be along phi and along r, so I have to basically scan the disk. So this point has to move all around the disk in order to find the total potential. So you see I have to integrate from phi, phi prime from 0 to 2 pi, r prime from 0 to a. So this is it. And uh, then I split the integral in two. There is an easy integral here with respect to d phi prime. You see nothing here depends on d phi prime. So basically I have d phi prime from zero to pi. I take out as well the constants. So I have the zero to two pi d phi prime. This is 2 pi. Integral is from 0 to a, r primed, dr primed, plus z squared. So this is a some, somewhat more complicated integral. Let me do it separately. So this is uh, basically the derivative of the square root of our prime squared plus z squared. And uh, that will give me a squared plus z squared uh, minus square root of z squared. So this is a squared plus z squared minus absolute value of z. So I do this uh, calculation just to be more general, if the point, the observation point was underneath, you would have absolute value of z equal to minus z. Now we have taken an observation point on the positive axis, so we have a positive uh, z. So z is greater than zero, zero here, therefore the result is a squared plus z squared minus z. And finally, uh, our potential final result uh, I collect everything I have found 2 pi and 4 pi will partially cancel out so they will give me a row s comma 0 by 2 epsilon naught and inside this uh, result with the square roots so we didn't finally avoid the square roots so this is the potential so if you notice, these are the same superposition steps uh, and the reference point for this potential is infinity. So now that I have a finite charge distribution, there is no problem in taking the reference point uh, to infinity. Okay. Uh, so any questions on this? So now that I have the electric field, I, sorry, the uh, potential, I can also find the electric field. And uh, uh, 
at this observation point. Uh, what electric field do you expect to see in terms of the direction? Any ideas? Yes. Right, so above the, uh, the disk, it is exactly the same uh, argument that we presented many times before, that for any dq here that creates an electric field like this, there will be on the disk a symmetric one, so that this uh, triangle will be isosceles, and then those two will add up uh, to give you a field in the z direction. So that is what we expect and I really encourage that uh, whenever you do uh, such calculations at the end, we should do a check to see if that agrees with our basic uh, analysis of the problem, physical analysis of the problem. So the electric field is minus gradient of the potential. Uh, here we have a potential that only depends on the z variable. So the gradient actually breaks down to the, the derivative of the potential with respect to z. So here I have the derivative of this minus 1, or if you wish, z hat rho s not the constant charge density to epsilon naught 1 minus z squared of a squared plus z squared. Okay, so this is the uh, field that uh, is generated by the electric field that is generated by this uh, charge distribution. Okay, and that uh, completes the problem. So you see the steps are similar, and uh, the only thing that this example brings uh, to our attention is really that when we have these uh, unit vectors for cylindrical uh, and uh, spherical coordinates that is non-Cartesian, you have to be very careful and immediately whenever you see, you see them, just replace them with their expression in Cartesian coordinates. In Cartesian unit vectors, the coordinates uh, are still cylindrical as you see. So I have the x hat and the y hat, but still are prime phi prime. All right, uh, so now an, an easier example, but a very important one. So it is uh, the electric dipole, and uh, the electric dipole is a system of two charges. Two point charges at a distance d from each other, so you have plus q and minus q. And uh, we're seeking the electric potential at an observation point P. Okay. So I define as R1 the distance from, uh, or R plus, the distance from the positive charge to the observation point, and as R minus the distance from the negative charge to the observation point. This is a trivial case of a finite charge distribution. We have two point charges at a distance d from each other, right? So therefore we can take again infinity as our reference point. So again, reference is at infinity. The question is, what is the potential at that observation point P? So any ideas? Yes. 
any ideas? So let me add that this point P, this is my axis, my origin. Uh, this is the y axis, so the z axis, sorry. And uh, this is distance of the, of the point R. So how much is the potential? Yes. I have a question. Yes. How are you exactly setting like the reference to infinity? Because like the R's are not exactly aligned. They are not aligned, but infinity is uh, infinity with respect to the origin. So if you go far away from the charges, you can set the reference point there at infinity. And there is no problem because at the end, these are point charges. So how would I apply superposition here? You will add. You will yeah, go ahead. You will add both of them, like the plus Q and the minus Q together. That's right. Plus Q by 4 pi epsilon naught distance are plus minus Q by 4 pi epsilon naught distance R minus. So it is as simple as that. This electric dipole is a very interesting uh, case. It seems trivial, but it is somewhat interesting because it represents polar molecules. So for example, in the beginning of the classes, we discussed the water molecule uh, where the uh, center of mass of positive charges is displaced from the center of mass of negative charges. So then macroscopically, this molecule looks like an electric dipole with a plus and a minus uh, charge. Uh, you may have seen this uh, device here. It is an antenna. It's an antenna. It's uh, the most popular type of an antenna. It's called dipole antenna. And the reason that we call it dipole is that as the current oscillates in these wires, there is excess charge of one sign on the one branch and excess charge of the opposite sign on the other branch. So at every point in time, this also behaves as a dipole. So this is a, a, a trivial case to look at. However, a very interesting one that is related to many applications. Now, there is a certain approximation of this formula that uh, we can use. And uh, here is how we arrive in this approximation. Imagine that we take the observation point very far from the charges, just like we would do if we were inspecting the field of an antenna from a base station to someone who is holding a cell phone and is connecting to that base station. So see what happens with these three uh, these three vectors. So this is my plus Q. This is minus Q. Imagine this point P going here. Okay. So this is uh, the R plus that I defined. This is the R minus that I defined. And this is the r distance of the observation point from the origin. Okay. Now imagine that you take this point even further away. So I take this point and I move it here. And then this is r plus. This is r. And this is R minus. So what do you notice about uh, the relative orientation of these three lines as this point is moving away? So if now I move it out of the board, how will it look like? So plus Q, minus Q, origin. If it is out of the board, then these, two li these three lines will just go and find somewhere this point P outside the board. So you see that they actually become parallel as the distance of the observation point grows from the origin. So this is what we call a far field approximation, which is very important when you are talking about dipoles, because many times we observe them very far away. For example, we observe molecules 
at distances that are much greater than the distances, the interatomic distances. Uh, same thing with antennas, fields from antennas. We observe them at hundreds of meters, whereas a tower, the, the uh, antennas are, as you see, a few centimeters long. So under this approximation, the three lines tend to become parallel to each other. This uh, angle here from the z-axis is the theta coordinate of my observation point. So my observation point P, which is somewhere outside the board, has coordinates, spherical coordinates, P of R theta phi. So this is R and this is theta. And as you see, under this approximation, if you draw here the projection of R plus onto R, so this is R plus, this is R minus, and you do the same for this one as well. First of all, you see that R plus is shorter than R by this distance. So then um, R plus is approximately equal to R minus D over 2 cosine theta. So this is uh, D over 2. And this is another D over 2. So you see the projection, this segment here is D over 2 cosine theta. Whereas R minus is longer than R by D over 2 cosine theta. So we have these uh, two approximations. And if we put them in, the potential of the dipole, which is this, and then this, You see, in the numerator, I have the difference between those two quantities. The difference is d cosine theta under this approximation. So this is d cosine theta. And r plus times r minus, you multiply them. You see it is uh, like uh, a minus b times a plus b, so that gives you r squared minus d, d over 2 cosine theta squared. I take the distance r much greater than the distance d. In fact, that is the root of my approximation here, that I have taken the observation point very far, much farther than the dipole. So imagine you're observing a small molecule from a few centimeters away. And therefore, you are very, very far from the distances between those charges. And when this happens, when r is much greater than d, then r squared is much greater than this. So I will get rid of this as well. And that gives me an approximation for the potential of the dipole. That looks like this. So this is the potential of the electric dipole. And uh, you can use the applet to visualize this potential, as well as the corresponding electric field that you can find from the gradient. So let me um, show you how it looks like. Okay. 
So as you would expect, uh, the electric field goes from a positive charge to the negative charge. And uh, if you look at uh, the expression for the potential, it is proportional to cosine theta. So when theta is pi over 2, 90 degrees, then we have basically the potential equal to 0. And this is the xy plane. So this line that you see over there, all the lines represent what we call equipotential surfaces. So you remember the equipotential surfaces are always perpendicular to the electric field. So as we have the field going away from the positive charge and sinking into the negative charge, the equipotential surfaces are actually always normal to the electric field. And this is the characteristic plane, theta equal pi over 2, that extends on the xy plane from minus infinity to plus infinity and corresponds to the equipotential line of zero potential. And you see this is consistent with our reference that potential is zero at infinity because this plane indeed extends all the way to infinity. So uh, that is uh, another indication that our approximation here uh, works well. All right, so that is uh, all I get to say about the potential of a dipole. Any questions? And just to draw also the, uh, what you just, uh, the picture that you just uh, saw, I can uh, draw it on the board, just so that you can have it a little bit more uh, clear. So this is plus Q, this is minus Q, this is the Z axis, the electric, and this is the z equal zero plane. So the electric field will go always from the positive to the negative charge. Looks like this. This is an equipotential line. V equals zero because theta is pi over two. Uh, we showed or we said that uh, electric fields are always perpendicular to equipot equipotential lines. So you can see here that the electric field is exactly perpendicular, exactly perpendicular to this plane z equals zero. So whatever you see there, whatever angle you see there is simply because my drawing is imperfect, the electric field should be perpendicular, exactly perpendicular to this equipotential line. And the rest of the equipotential lines are like this, always remaining perpendicular to the electric field. So these are the equipotentials. All right. All right, uh, so that's all for the electric potential of a dipole and generally potentials of charge distributions. I won't have the time to enter conductors today, but I have one more thing to say about uh, the scalar potential and uh, this law that we saw, the second law that we saw that the electric field satisfies. And that is And that is that the line integral of the electric field over any closed path is zero. So we saw that this basically is an expression 
of the physical fact that the electric field is cons the electric force is conservative and therefore the work that it does over a closed path is zero. So if you imagine multiplying this by a charge Q, then this becomes the work of the force over a closed path, it is zero. Just like gravity, if you take uh, the choke holder, you push it up and then you bring it down, the work that you do over this closed path is uh, zero. So that tells us that generally, if you have any arbitrary closed path and you take the integral e dot dl, that will give you zero no matter what. Imagine that this path follows an electric circuit. So imagine that this path goes along an electric circuit and you can put whatever elements you, you wish here. What do we know about electric circuits? One thing that we know is that uh, currents and voltages in electric circuits satisfy, can I have your attention please, satisfy Kirchhoff's laws, Kirchhoff current law, Kirchhoff voltage law. What is Kirchhoff voltage law here? It's uh, plus V1 plus V2 plus V3 and V4 equals to V. Okay, so this is uh, this is this. So simply if I uh, put these as points 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, we see here that uh, V1, 2 plus V2, 3 plus V, or if you wish, 2, 1, 3, 2, 4, 3, 5, 4, 5, 1 is equal to 0. This is Kirchhoff's voltage law. But if you express these voltages with respect to the associated electric field along the circuit, you are actually getting this law here. So this second law of electrostatics applied to an electric circuit is really Kirchhoff's voltage law. Fundamentally, these two are the same. You can identify each segment of this closed path integral as the voltage between the points along the segment. So therefore, as you are integrating here, you are just adding voltages and what the law tells you that these voltages along a closed path have to adapt to zero. And this is exactly what you see in Kirchhoff's voltage law. That is the first uh, note. So I have two notes here. That is the first. The second, is that in vector calculus, one can prove that this equation has a consequence that the curl of the electric field is equal to zero. So E dot DL along a closed path equals zero means that the curl of the electric field is zero. So in other words, the electric field is curl free. So this uh, sounds like a, an ad for a shampoo. However, it has a concrete physical meaning as well, that the electric field is what we call curl free. And um, of course, curl is an operator that maps a vector to a vector. So for example, in Cartesian, or I won't write the equations here on the board, but you can check your age sheet, how it looks in Cartesian coordinates and cylindrical coordinates and spherical coordinates. A curl-free electric field, a curl-free field is a field that if you imagine that the field lines represent a water stream and you throw in a wheel like this,
the field won't turn the wheel. And you can check in uh, the fields of a point charge, of the fields of a capacitor that we have seen, or any other fields that we have seen, that if you imagine throwing in a wheel, the field will not spin the wheel. Because here, on the two wings of the wheel, falls the same force. And therefore, the one exercises a torque this way, the other exercises a torque this way, and the wheel does not rotate. Uh, a field that has curl would look pretty much like this. So if you throw in a wheel, there is more torque on this side than this side. And then you see the wheel spinning. So by inspection, one can see what a curl means, uh, mathematics apart. And you can check in all the cases of fields that we have seen that indeed it is true that the curl is not zero. Uh, same thing as well with the field of a power line. Imagine again throwing in a wheel. No spin, no spin, no spin, no spin, yes spin. But unfortunately, this is not an electric field. So I'll stop here. Thanks for your attention. And uh, we'll continue on Wednesday with conductors and dielectrics. <laughs>